composition. So that's one of the real you know, wins for all things organization is that it'll be a much faster algorithm and it'll have much lower space overhead too. Uh, but one of the things I want to emphasize is that you know, the types of guarantees that you get for all tangentization really don't quite achieve what we get for the nuclear norm minimization. So that's really important. As we'll see, and we'll talk about them, they're both quantitatively different in terms of uh, what the number of observations depends on. It can depend on things not just on you know, n, the, the dimension, the rank, r, and the incoherence, but it can also depend on things like the condition number of the matrix and other sorts of other parameters. So that's a quantitatively weak aspect of them. But they're also qualitatively weaker aspects that, you know, as we see the proof for altering minimization, or at least the main ideas in it, you should keep in mind and be thinking about how brittle is this proof to the actual stochastic assumptions we're making about how our observations are generated. So that's a really important point. All right, so our plan for today is to at least <coughs> a sketch of the main ideas of why all training minimization works for matrix completion, why there are much lower tech algorithms that do provably interesting things. All right, so, and uh, just to tell you where this is coming from, so, so a really influential paper in this line was this paper of Jane, Metropoli, and Sangabi. And there were a lot of improvements and clarifications of what's really going on in this paper by uh, Hart. So we're actually mostly going to follow uh, Hart's exposition. But one of the really interesting things that came out of you know, this sequence of papers is the idea of how to show that altering minimization makes progress. So we've talked about this a few times, that you know, altering minimization, the way that you would design this as a heuristic, is you start off with some non-convex optimization <coughs> problem, like trying to find the minimum rank matrix that agrees to your observations so far. And what do you do? You just make it convex by guessing one of the two sides, optimizing over the other, and alternating back and forth. So it's a rather naive way at first glance to think about how you can make a non-convex optimization problem behave sort of like it's convex. Uh, but one of the real, really interesting aspects of these papers is trying to understand what's the right progress measure for showing that altering optimization works. So the main thing that we're going to be talking about today is what are called principal angles. That'll be the way that we show that altering optimization makes progress. So okay, so with this on the side, the first thing I want to do is I want to make our lives a bit easier. So it'll actually be a lot easier. You know, usually we think about this unknown matrix as being highly asymmetric, because after all, in the Netflix problem, it's really you know the users are the rows and the movies are the columns. So not only is it not symmetric, its dimensions don't even match because they represent different types of objects. But it turns out that there's a way to actually take any algorithm for symmetric matrix completion, you know, that works for symmetric matrices, and turn it into an algorithm that works in the asymmetric case. So that's what I want to tell you about, is just a reduction from the asymmetric case to the symmetric case. It's a very simple reduction. So let's first reduce the asymmetric case to the symmetric case. And there's something very natural that we can do. So let's say M is U sigma V transpose. So this is the asymmetric matrix, which we'd like to complete from random observations. All we're going to do is we're going to create a new matrix a, this will be what we'll work with throughout today, in the natural way. So that's it. That's the reduction. Okay. So the important things about this reduction, though, are that the first thing to notice is that imagine we are given random observations from M. 
So the point is that we should be able to simulate random observations from A. So that's the statement that at least we can simulate samples from this stochastic model where we get random observations from this one. And the way to think about this is if I chose a random entry from A, what I can do is if sometimes it lands in the zero, then I can just spit out zero, and that's fine. And wherever else it lands, I can <coughs> interpret that as my dart into M. Or to put it another way, given enough darts into M, which are uniformly random observations, it's not hard to see that you can construct uniformly random observations from A. So that I'll just sort of state as a claim. I don't want to get too much of the details, but that's really claim number one here, is that given uniformly at random samples, from M, we can simulate roughly the same number of samples from A. So this, um, this is true actually for many different sampling models. You know, if instead, for example, you had some probability and each of the entries in M were observed independently, then the same way you can think about a model where you observe each entry in A you know, independently, you observe some of the zeros, but then when you happen to reveal some of the entries in here, you're relying on the fact that you've revealed the entries in M. So you can use samples in really many different sampling models to go from one to the other. But really the key claim in all of this, which is just you know, the formal point that I want to make, is that the nice thing is that uh, we can actually take a solution for, you know, uh, so, so if I gave you an algorithm for completing A, then you could just read off the entries in M because you would just read them off from this bottom left-hand corner. So these are you know, two aspects of the correctness of the model. First, that the stochastic model, we can use samples from here to simulate samples from there. And that from an answer to here, we can get an answer to here. But the remaining thing we need to say is that this reduction preserves the niceness of our instance. So what makes this problem nice is the fact that it's a low rank and heat cooker in matrix. And what we also care about is whether this reduction of just putting M and M transpose into this matrix to make it explicitly symmetric also preserves the fact that it's low rank and incoherent. So can anyone tell me what the rank of A would be here? If the rank of N is R? It should be 2R. It should be 2R, right? Not only, so that's one aspect, right? Is that we go from a low rank matrix to a low rank matrix. We just increase the rank by 2. Not a big deal. Uh, but we also care about not just low rank, but incoherence. So uh, incoherence, if you remember, is a property of the singular vectors of the matrix. Because it's what enforces that the non-zeros of n can't be too concentrated in just a few locations. So what we really care about is if we want to say that A is also incoherent here, we really care about is what's the singular value decomposition of M, of A. Anyone have any guesses for the singular value decomposition? I claim we can actually explicitly write it out here. And this is a very natural thing to do to a matrix. Where am I going to get my two times R singular vectors? Yep, so I'm going to concatenate U and V, U, I, and V, I. Now there is, uh, let me write out what the actual SVD is. So what I claim is that the SVD of A, so there's a slight subtlety here, which I'll explain in a second, is I claim we can write it out this way. So remember, R is the rank of the original matrix, and the U, I's and V, I's are its uh, left and right singular vectors, respectively. 
So one thing I can do is I can concatenate the singular vectors. So I can take vi and ui. And that's good because that's the dimension of this matrix, is if it was an n1 by n2 matrix, then it's an n1 plus n2 by n1 plus n2 matrix. So I'm at least getting vectors the right dimension. Now there's a slight subtlety here, which is the other, you know, I have to, this would only give me r singular vectors, and I know that in general the rank has gone from r to 2r. So where do I get my other singular vectors? Is I need to cancel the diagonal entries. So the way that I can do this now is I can also take, you know, sigma i here, and I can multiply it by vi minus ui times minus vi transpose ui transpose. So in fact, the way to check this claim is just to explicitly check all the entries in this block diagonal matrix. So the first thing that's easy to check is that if you look at the contribution in the top left in this block diagonal matrix, whatever you get here is just gonna explicitly cancel out what you get here. The same is true in the bottom right, but that block goes to zero. And if you think about the contribution to the bottom left now, you're actually gonna get the matrix just from this guy. You're gonna get the matrix again from this guy, and I multiply by a half to make it all work out. So this is actually explicitly what the SVD of A is. And what it allows you to say is that it allows you to say nice things like if M is incoherent, then A is incoherent too. Because you can just look at what the singular vectors of the new matrix look like. And it's very intuitive that you know, if you had a matrix M, which didn't have you know, too large of max entry, then for sure this embedding trick is going to make sure that A also doesn't have too large a max entry, which is the thing you're worried about, as well as some of the other properties like, you know, incoherence was also this property that the singular vectors are fairly uncorrelated with the standard basis vectors. And from this explicit decomposition, it's easy to see that if it was true for M, it'll be true for A too, because I'm really just concatenating. So I don't want to you know, get too much. You know, this is actually a very, very messy proof. I can't go through all the details. But I want to sketch you the main ideas on this. So this is the first main idea, is that, that we can reduce the asymmetric case to the symmetric case. And it really follows from these different pieces. It follows, yeah? Sorry, no question, but is that the same minus? Here? Yeah. Um, Don't want the, the cross term to go away. We want the, oh, yeah, yes, yes. So I think it's OK here. Uh, another way of thinking about this is this matrix, just for intuition's sake, right? it's definitely not PSD. Why not? Because it's symmetric and its trace is zero, but definitely has some negative uh, eigenvalues. And so that's why you know, this first term is the outer product of a vector with itself. They both have non-negative coefficients. This outer product better be a vector and it's negative. Otherwise, I've done something horribly wrong, and I've come up with a PSD decomposition for a matrix that's not PSD. So that's another way of thinking about it, just for intuition's sake. right? But in this reduction from the asymmetric case to the symmetric case, really the main ingredients are that I can take samples from M, simulate samples from A, that I can take an answer for A, an exact completion, and recover an exact completion for M, uh, for the original matrix, and that this reduction not only introduces symmetry, but it preserves all of the nice properties that we cared about, such as the rank at most doubles, the incoherence parameter, if you work it out, it at most doubles too, and all the other nice things about M carry over to A. So this just makes life easier, because actually when we talk about altering minimization, instead of having two steps where we alternate between fixing one side and iterating over the other, we'll actually only ever be doing fixing one side and iterating over that one side. So instead of two steps, 
avoid bought ourselves that we only care about one step. So that's the main point. Are there any questions about this the sketch of the reduction? Does this make sense? Great. All right, so let me tell you what alternate optimization is. This is what we want to analyze. So for the rest of the lecture, we're going to be talking about purely symmetric matrix completion, and we want to prove that alternate optimization works. All right, so you know, one of the things which will make our lives easier is we're going to let GX of Y, where GS stands for Greg Schmidt. So in general, we'll think about you know, Y as being an N by R matrix. So its columns give us a dimension R subspace, just based on their column span. And we're going to let Greg Schmidt of Y denote. orthonormal basis for column span of Y. And we get this via the Gram Schmidt procedure. Hence the nomenclature. Where, if you don't remember what that is, all we do is we take the first column, we normalize it so that it has unit norm, we take the second column, we subtract off its projection onto the span that we found so far, the span of the first column, and then we renormalize it. So in this way, we build up our orthonormal basis inductively by making sure that each new vector is orthonormal to the basis we found so far, and we do exactly this procedure. So very simple polynomial time computation. This shorthand will just make it easier to think about what's the meat going on <coughs> in optimization. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with the following algorithm, which I'm going to call batch alternating optimization. And the reason it's batch is because what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to partition omega, our set of observations, into omega 1 through omega L for L equals C log N. So we're going to make sure that each of these sets of observations omega I is at least N times R times log N observations. And we're going to have log N of these phases. So does this remind you of anything? Exactly. This is what we did in quantum golfing, right? Because what we did was when we passed to the dual, we talked about we batched up the set of observations, and we used each one plus matrix Bernstein bounds to take a swing in the right direction. So we batched into log n swings, and each swing had enough uh, samples that we could appeal to matrix Bernstein bounds and show that we're getting in the right direction. So it's actually kind of funny because many of the same proof techniques that work for nuclear norm minimization are also used in proving that alternate minimization works. It's just that the, um, the approach for nuclear norm minimization, a lot of these arguments happen in the dual. So in the dual, we can pretend we already know the matrix and the way that we actually implement the quantum golfing was with this PT operation where we project <coughs> into a space that we wish we knew, because that would help us figure out the matrix. Here, these swings are actually going to happen only in the primal. These are things which we have to actually figure out what to do with these set of observations. So that's already a big difference, is that instead of the argument happening, you know, this quantum golfing plus matrix Bernstein happening in the dual, we're really talking about what these arguments mean in the primal. Okay, 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to partition omega into these log n sets. So that's very similar to uh, quantum dolphin. What we're going to do is we're going to initialize y0, which is an n by r matrix, randomly. And we're going to set x0 is Greg Schmidt of y0. That's certainly something we can do. We can just guess randomly for y. OK, and now the meat of this argument is how do we make progress? And so for L phases, what we're going to do is we're just going to set each y sub i equal to the solution to a least squares problem. So we're going to look at the arg min over y. Remember, r omega i is this operation that only takes the entries in omega i and zeroes out everything else. So we're going to look at just the least squares problem which we have access to. And we're going to take our old guess, and we're going to ask, you know, this is the uh, Grant Schmidt of the old guess yi. So we've already fixed which subspace in the columns we want the explanation to lie in. And this is an n by r matrix, because that's what y was. And that's what we get out of Graham Schmidt. And all this has to do is to find an r by n matrix that solves this least squares problem, gets as close as possible to a on the observations in our batch. So that's what we're going to prove. And at the end of the day, what you do is you output XL. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, and I'm going to set X sub i equal to Graham Schmidt of Y sub i and continue. So, what I'm going to do at the end of the day is I'm just going to take whatever my guess is, so what I found in this last stage, I can take xl minus 1 times yl transpose. And what we want to show is that that really is close to a at the end of the day. So does this algorithm make sense? This is our batched alternate minimization. Now, one of the important things about this is that it's batched. So people never batch in practice. What you do is you just take your entire set of samples. And it's actually much more involved to prove things about alternatization without this batching. That's kind of one of the frustrating things about uh, you know, proving things here, is that you know, naturally you'll see that there's a lot of intuition that batching is just making things technically easier to analyze, but you shouldn't really do it. And it just becomes really involved to actually try and prove that not batching still works. So we won't get into that, but it's something I want to point out. The other thing is what we're really going to show is that x, xl minus 1, or these you know, xi in general, they're going to really, all we care about is what space they spend. I don't care about what the basis is. And what we really want to say is that when we take A and we look at its left singular vectors, you know, there are R of them. We want that the space spanned by the columns of x is close to the space spanned by the, the r singular vectors of a. So that's ultimately what we want to prove is that our metric for showing that this thing is going to work will be showing that those two spaces in terms of their angle between them actually do converge. So now what I want to do is I want to give you some intuition for what this is doing before we get into you know, the proof. So this is really the key step. It's just how do we update what our space is. This gives us a way of going from xi minus 1 to xi. And what I care about is the column span. So we can think about it this way as actually um, you know, solving the least squares problem. So this is what the symmetrization argument has bought us, is that we don't need to solve, alternate between two least squares problems. We can just keep solving one of them, because we're in the symmetric case. 
But what I really want to understand is what this step does. And this will give us a new way of thinking about why incoherence is the right parameter for matrix completion and why we should make progress. We're going to see many of the same techniques that we already talked about come up yet again. Okay, so you know, in order to finish this lecture, I'm going to have to assert a few things, but I'll prove something at the very end. So this claim is not too hard to show. You know, just like for a standard least squares problem, which you're used to, uh, what's nice about it is not only that you can solve it efficiently in poly time, but moreover, it actually admits a nice closed form solution. And it turns out that when you look at this least squares problem and you ask what is its closed form solution, it actually has a rather appealing description. This is where we're going to derive a lot of our insights. I'm not going to prove this claim, but I'm just going to state it that there's actually a different way of thinking about how x of i minus 1 gets transformed into x of i. And it comes from just writing out what the explicit closed form solution is to this particular least squares problem. But it turns out that uh, you can write it out explicitly as if I were to solve r min over y of r omega of a minus x y transpose, where this is orthonormal, then it turns out that you can think about what that y is just as taking your matrix A, restricting it to omega, and multiplying it by x. So this turns out to be the explicit closed form for what this operation does. This is the thing which we're really going to derive all of our insight from, is this step is this is the sense in which when we care about what angle this space makes with the true subspace we're looking for, we'll look at what this action does with a fresh set of samples and how it actually rotates one space into the next one that we want. And that's why this thing makes progress. So I think that's one of the really surprising things about the sequence of you know, papers was that you could look at this and say that I want to make progress based on the objective function I'm trying to optimize. You know, you could say that x times y becomes closer and closer to this unknown matrix that we want to know in Frobenius norm. That's the thing which the altering minimization heuristic is naturally trying to optimize. That's non-convex, but it's doing altering minimization nonetheless. But the really interesting insight is to think about what this does as actually being a noisy matrix matrix multiplication. And to think about the progress measure not in terms of the Frobenius norm of your answer to the true answer, but in terms of the angle between the space to the space you're looking for. So that's one of the really interesting things is that there's a very different potential function underneath it that's really making progress. So now what I want to say is that we can rewrite this rule, star, which is the key step in the update. Now, the first claim is that you know, when I'm thinking about x as making progress towards the subspace that I want to know, it doesn't actually matter if I scale this y that I get. When you scale some y and take Graham Schmidt, you still get the same x at the end of the day. So what will actually be more convenient to think about is to think about rewriting this rule as instead y sub i equals p, where this is just some scalar, times r omega i of a times x sub i minus 1. So it'll be more convenient adding a scalar in here. That's not really going to change how our x changes over the course of the algorithm, but it'll be a sort of simplifying assumption. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose p, so that remember omega i is this random set of observations, right? And we have that um, you know omega i is let's say m or n times r times log n. Then what we're going to set p to be is we're just going to set it to be 
equal to the fraction of entries that we observe. So in this way, what's going on here is that we can think about this as a random sampling approximation to some underlying matrix. Oops. Sorry, should be one over So this operation in this way, I've set it up so that now the expectation of this operation really is the true matrix A. So are there any questions about that statement? I'm just trying to turn this into a matrix Bernstein type of bound that we've already talked about. Now the magic starts happening. So let's do the following. Let's make our lives easier. Let's just pretend it was a times xi minus 1. But we have some error. So I'm just going to add in some error here that accounts for this difference. And so what's going to happen here is we have 1 over p times r omega of i times a minus a times x of i minus 1. So that's just the same rule. And we're going to think about this as being the noise in our matrix vector multiplication, uh, matrix matrix multiplication. So the way to think about this is that if this term was 0, we know exactly what this type of operation does. So I'll make that precise, but it's actually just the standard power method. So what we really care about for proving that alternating minimization works is we've used this explicit form to turn it into a question about why noisy power method works. So let me make this more precise. Let's first think about what this looks like when this noise term is 0, so that we know what intuition we're already bringing to the table. So this is the first question. So let's think about this iterative scheme, because what we really care about is batched alternate minimization is doing some noisy variant of this iterative procedure. Let's think about it in like a noise-free case, and let's try and understand what's going on. And then what we really want to do is we want to add noise back in and say that it does roughly the same thing. So let's think about the following simplified update procedure. What we're going to do is we're going to choose y0 is random, again, and it's n by r. And we're going to let x0 be Gramsci Schmidt of y0. And then what we're going to do is for L iterations, we're going to set y sub i equal to a times x sub i minus 1. And we're going to set x sub i equal to Graham Schmidt of y sub i. And the question is, so this procedure makes sense, right? All we're doing is we're removing the noise in it, and we're just taking a random guess the same way and always maintaining the invariant that x sub i is an orthonormal basis for the columns of y sub i, because we're always going to enforce this Graham Schmidt procedure. And we're just going to keep updating, you know, y i is a times x sub i minus 1. And we take Graham Schmidt, we keep doing this. And the question is, what does x sub i converge to? 
And let me make this simpler. The first question is, in the case of R equals 1, so x0, y0 is an n by 1 matrix, so it's just a vector. And all we're doing is we're just, you know, Grant Schmidt then is just renormalizing that vector. That's all it does. And we keep multiplying by this matrix. So the question is for R equals 1 first, what does this procedure converge to? Yes, the largest uh, eigenvector, in the because we're looking at symmetric matrices. Okay, exactly. Right? So everyone sees that. Any questions about this? What should it converge to for larger R? R equals two. First two. So in general, this converges the first R which is, of course, all the singular vectors we want, because A is rank R. Yep? Do you mean that uh, I mean that you can put this on any, like, the vector, initial vector, first one, you can put it in any vector? Yes, so it's really with almost surely over this random thing, because you're very unlikely to not have some representation in you know, the top part, or to miss any. So really assuming, just to make sure we're on the same page, A is symmetric. It's not necessarily PSD, because that's what our reduction bought us. So really, you can think of it as you know, explicitly that decomposition up there. It's something of that form. You know, I could move this negative sign to the sigma i, so I really have sigma i minus sigma i. And you really care about the magnitude of that. The largest magnitude thing, you're going to converge to that. In this case, the subspace is degenerate, because there are two things. And you can converge to anything in that space. And when you set r equals 2, you converge to that space. And when you set r equals 3, you get the next thing, and so on. So in this way, you actually get all of what you wanted out of it. You're going to get what is the you know, column span of this unknown matrix A, what are its uh, singular vectors, directly from this iterative multiplication. This is just the power of it. Right? And in that sense, the key idea is that batched alternative normalization on a symmetric matrix is noisy power method. And what does the noise come from? Is the noise. So where does the noise come from? How can we try and bound the noise? I've said it a bunch of times already. Hmm? Uh, sure, I'm asking a much more basic question than that. That'll be how we prove that noisy power method works is through principal angles. But I'm just trying to, so in this setting, we set the noise to zero, and we saw that it was exactly alternated, it was exactly power method, which we know what it does on a matrix. But it's not that batched alternate minimization is the power method, it's the noisy power method. We have this G sub i term, but how could you go about trying to prove that G sub i is not too large? Now there's the issue of when it's not too large, how do you prove that noisy power method still works? That's when we'll do principal angles. But you know, someone give me some intuition for why G sub I should not be that large. Yes, matrix Bernstein. Exactly. Right? So, you know, last time what we used over and over again was the fact that some random matrix like this, whose expectation is the thing that we're subtracting off, so its expectation is zero, we gave spectral bounds on how large this is. 
What was important in a lot of those things, that's where we actually used incoherence. So this is another way to think about why incoherence is the right parameter, is let's hypothetically think about what if A were not incoherent? What if it had just ones along the diagonal and it had R in it? Then the big issue is that these two things would not be close to each other at all, because I'd just be very unlikely to even see the ones. So I'd get something large here. So the way to think about incoherence is incoherence is the property that allows you to say that this random matrix is close in spectral bounds to its expectation. So that's really where incoherence comes from. It's just the random sampling property of what you need about a matrix to make sure that a random sample of it is spectrally close to the true matrix. So that's another way to think about incoherence. All right, so what I really want to do now is I want to talk about why the noisy power method works. So we're going to go back to the case where g sub i is non-zero, and I'm going to give you a general lemma statement about what this converges to. And uh, I'm not going to go through any of the messy details about calculating what these bounds on g sub i are or what they imply. So I just want you to focus on the qualitative question when g sub i is non-zero in general, what sorts of guarantees can we get? So can we understand what the power method does in the presence of noise? So that's it. And that'll be the main point of why all chain minimization works. Any other questions? No? So let's talk about principal angles. This will be the workhorse of understanding what the power method does that works even in a robust setting when you have noise. So these principal angles are really beautiful concepts. Uh, they don't get used that much. So you know, actually, the properties will look too good to be true. It'll be kind of surprising that all of your normal trig works. Uh, so let me give you the definition. So we'll look at the cosine of the principal angle between 2 n by r orthonormal matrices. So two different orthonormal bases for dimension r subspaces. It turns out that the way that I'm going to find the principal angle, I'm going to use what the representation is, you know, what the actual orthonormal basis is, because I care about this as a matrix, and I care about this as a matrix. But all of the definitions I give you actually will be invariant under which orthonormal basis you choose. That's not a big deal. It's really a geometric statement about how the two subspaces interact. It's something which, uh, you know, when the two subspaces are the same, it'll be easy to see that the angle will be zero and the cosine will evaluate to one. But more generally, what this is, it'll be the sort of progress measure for thinking about why x is converging to u, independent of which orthonormal basis you choose for representing its column span, that doesn't matter. But you define it as the minimum singular value of u transpose times x. So it's an R by R matrix, and you just look at the smallest singular value. Right? So this is something which certainly when U 
equals x, you're just going to get an r by r identity matrix. And you definitely get one here. So that satisfies at least one of the things that I told you, that when the two subspaces are the same, that you get one for the cosine of the principal angle. That's fine. Uh, it turns out that there are a lot of other trigonometric angles you can define, and that they have all of the usual properties that you would expect, I think. I don't know what property they don't have. Uh, so you can also define the sine of the principal angle. And it turns out that you can define this as sigma max of u perf transpose x. Hmm? Uh, u perf. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take any orthonormal basis for the orthogonal complement for the column span of u. And I'm going to use this notation throughout that we'll care about u being the singular vectors of this unknown matrix A that we care about. So it'll be an n by r matrix. And then u perp here is going to be a um, n minus r by n matrix. matrix is this u perp transpose. And its rows are going to be orthonormal, because its rows are just a basis for the orthogonal complement to this column span of u. And what you do here is you just create this uh, n minus r by uh, r matrix. And you look at the largest singular value, and that's the sign of your angle. And you can define tan theta of u x in the usual way. So these are our fundamental definitions for trigonometric functions of the principal angle. Of course, you can define the principal angle just by taking the arc cos of this. Or you can define it as taking the arc sine of this. Or you can do it as defining define the arc tan of this. And the property which is not obvious at all, because these are not just angles of simple objects, is the fact that these definitions are self-consistent. That's not at all obvious. So that's one of the sort of magic about principal angles, is that these things do work out. Not going to prove it. And in fact, The really important fact we're going to use, again, not going to prove this, is that there's even a nice expression explicitly for tan of u x. To the same way we've defined cosine and sine in terms of some you know, singular values of some matrices. But we've defined tan of theta based on sine of theta and cos of theta. So there actually is a definition for tan of theta, which only involves you know, the operator norm of some matrices. And what it is is it's just you take u perp transpose times x times ux inverse operator norm. Oops, sorry, should this be a transpose? Yeah. So that'll be the fact we'll use. But now let me tell you the main one. So this will be the last thing we prove.
parse this for you in a minute. So this is the key level. It's actually not hard to prove from these collection of facts. It's very straightforward. This is the heart of understanding why noisy power method works, <clears throat> is that if we look at the tangent of the angle between u and x sub i, we want to prove that these things converge. So we want the tangent of the angle to go to zero. That way the sine of the angle is going to zero and the angle itself is going to zero. So this is our progress measure. We care about using the principal angle or rather the tangent of the principal angle as the driving force to show that u converges, you know, x sub i converges to u. And the way that we're going to do this is we get this relation based on the r plus first singular value. So it's even going to work when you're somewhat close to being ranked r. So you even have some bound on sigma r plus 1 is not uh, too large. And um, so there's a plus here. And one of the things to think about is in this bound, you know, what happens if I set g sub i to be 0? So this is a case that we already talked about what it converges to because it's just the power method with no noise. So in that case, I get a 0 here, I get a 0 here. And all I'm getting is I'm getting that um, then this works out to just be tan of theta of u x sub i is at most sigma r plus 1 over sigma r times the old tangent. That's great. Why? Why is this great? Why does this recover the power method bounds we already talked about? I claim that this bound, in the case of gi equals 0, tells us already that for the power method, we converge to the span of the top r singular vector. bound is you just have this multiplier which is less than one by definition and uh, you know independent of what that is when it's less than one you just get a geometric rate I mean the, obviously the base of the geometric rate depends on that ratio but uh, you converge very rapidly for the true answer right? so there are a lot of faster things you can do for finding the span of the top bar singular vectors like you know for those of you who know some numerical analysis you can do things like the Langsos method which is, in general, better behaved. But one of the nice things about the power method is that it admits guarantees, which work in the noisy case, too, that degenerate to the old guarantees, too. So that's the cool thing, is that when you work with the principal angles, you get a more general fact, which contains some of the things you already know. And it gives you a quantitative bound on how much noise can actually distort the noisy power method. So let's prove this. This is actually a simple one, a very pretty one. All right. So remember that x sub i equals the Gram Schmidt of y sub i. That's the way we've defined it. So what that means then is that we can actually write x of i as y sub i times r, where this is some invertible matrix. And this follows just out of Gram Schmidt. So this Gram Schmidt procedure where you take the first column and you scale it so that it's a unit vector. And then you take the second column and you subtract off its projection onto the space you've already created. 
and then renormalize that. Well, when you look at what that procedure did to the columns of Y, then it's actually very easy to see that you're multiplying by an invertible matrix. In fact, it's upper triangular. And those, I forget upper or lower, but it's triangular. And that way, it's definitely invertible. So that's great. So we're just explicitly writing out the representation we get via Graham Schmidt. And also, we're just going to use the following completely basic observation that when we take uh, what this term is right here, so it's u transpose times x, x sub i, rather. And what we're going to do is we're just going to plug in what x sub i is. So it's y sub i times r, just by definition of what Graham Schmidt is. We're taking its inverse. So this is a very easy thing to write out, but we're going to write it out in a convenient way, where it's r inverse times u transpose times y i inverse. Great. And now we're almost there, believe it or not. So now what we can do is we're just going to write out what tan of theta is. So tan theta u of x of i, that's the thing we want to found. All it is, is we can use this fact one right here. just by definition. But now what we can do is we can plug in what u transpose x sub i is. It's this quantity. And we can just write out what this guy is. And lo and behold, nice things are going to start happening. This is? Yi. Yes, yi. Good. So at the end of the day, all this is equal to, it's just the basic fact actually about this representation of principal angles of the tangent is that you can actually take, it actually doesn't matter that this is orthonormal, it only matters what its column span is. That's all we're doing here is we're actually changing the x to the y. And that's ex uh, exactly what we did, just based on these, you know, simple equalities. And all we're going to do is we're going to upper bound it based on the product of the two operator norms. Now we just want to bound term one and term two. One of these terms we're going to get the numerator, one we're going to get the denominator. Very simple. So let's do that. So for the first term, all we have is we have u perp transpose times y sub i. Well, we can upper bound this. So remember what y sub i is. y sub i is uh, a times x sub i minus 1 plus gi times x sub i minus 1, because we have that extra noise term that comes from the gi. So all we can do in this is um, Actually, I can remove this x sub i. It doesn't actually affect the operator norm. It's only going to give me an upper bound on it because it was orthonormal by definition. 
So that's great because removing it, you know, it, it's operating normal is the most one for sure. So now we're in good shape. And what I claim is that this quantity right here, uh, can anyone try and bound this using uh, the principal angles and the singular values? Try and bound it using sine. What? No. Yes. Uh, if I use that, that is true. I could bound it by the norm of a times the sine of uh, the angle between u and x of i minus one. Now, what I don't like about that bound, though, and I'll need to improve, is that that would involve sigma one, the maximum value of a. But actually, I claim I can get a tighter bound here because I'm using u per in there. And remember that u is exactly the first r singular vectors of a. So there's a slightly better bound I can get here. Still the same sign, but can anyone improve upon the term to beat is norm of a times the sign of the principal angle? Can anyone beat that? Uh, so what's your so instead of normal operator norm of a, what do you get? Yes, exactly. This is at most sigma r plus one times the sine of the principal angle. Why? Because this u perk kills all but, uh, kills all of the first r singular vectors. So the resulting operator norm I get from this part is actually you know, sigma r plus one. So I can do a bit better than operator norm of a, and that's important. And this term, I'm just going to use the, um, the natural bound for. Good. Now let's do the second. Let's do it over here. What I really care about is sigma min of u transpose y i. This I claim is at least sigma min of u transpose a times x of i minus 1 minus the operator norm of u transpose g i times x of i minus 1. And again, I can only make my life harder by removing this x of i minus 1 because it's orthonormal, and I'm subtracting more. This is fine, but now what about this quantity right here? Can anyone bound this for me, lower bound it, using cosine? I heard the right answer whispered. I didn't hear the right answer. Sorry. <laughs> so sigma one, um, sigma one might not be true. See, what if sigma r is zero? Then that would kind of kill me because the sigma min of this resulting thing is definitely going to be zero. Sigma r. So, uh, the only, so the only thing is that what's going to happen here is I take u transpose, and I have you know, u times the sigmas. You know, there are r of them. And then I have u transpose again out here. And you know, you're thinking about really take the absolute values of these sigmas, it's all fine. And what's going on here is that this u picks up, you know, and uh, just uh, you, know, you can pull out this a and put in a diagonal term, which is the sigmas. And then the important thing is actually not taking the operator norm of that sigma, but taking the minimum singular value of that. So that's the only difference, is that what you end up getting is that this quantity is at least sigma r times cosine theta of u times x of i minus 1. And that's it. Okay. So now I have that this tangent is the product of these things. And all I've gotten is my target numerator is the sigma r plus 1 times sine plus this you know, remaining term, uh, u perp times gi, the operator on that. And I have my denominator because I've uh, lower bounded this, um, 
Uh, I really take the reciprocal of this, because this is the sigma min, so I need one over what this lower bound is, and that becomes my denominator right here. It's the sigma r cosine theta minus some cross term. So that actually implies the proof. So we're done. So this is why the, no, the power method is actually robust to noise. This is a guarantee which via the help of principal angles and these basic trigonometric facts about them, it degenerates the thing you already know that power method recovers the top R singular vectors. And moreover, it gives an interesting guarantee as soon as GI is small compared to sigma R plus one, for example. It tells you that you make progress. Now the full bound, you know, how this, this is really the heart of the argument about why all fingerization works, it becomes much messier to prove that these things work. Because the issue is that what I really want to do when I recover the underlying you know, matrix, right? So you're thinking about uh, this, if I still have it up. So we're thinking about this uh, noisy vector uh, matrix matrix multiplication. Now the issue is once I fix the size of omega i, this has some quantitative norm error, this g sub i. It's something that I can calculate via matrix Bernstein. But what I really want is I want that the noise is going to decrease. Because that's the only way that when I you know, turn this g sub i and make it decrease, I'm going to get that the principal angle really is going to zero and it's not getting stuck someplace. And what you really then care about is you care about this matrix itself being incoherent. You know, that when you subtract off the part that you figured out already, that you get a lower Frobenius norm still incoherent matrix, and you continue to make progress. That's where things get really messy, is because this is really the first step in showing that you get a pretty good approximation. And then you need to control the error through the principal angles and make it work all the way down. Yep? You tried to send to batch Exactly. You can't. You have to do more work. Ah, okay. So in fact, this isn't even the version of the algorithm that you have to do, is that you actually have to add noise back in to make sure that in each phase, the matrix you're working with is smaller than the previous ones. That'll be based on the progress you're making, but continues to be incoherent. And that's the way that you'll get a smaller bound for G sub i in each phase geometrically. And then you'll actually be able to plug it through this you know, bound, and G sub i will tune down as you go through the phases. So that's the much more delicate part of the argument, which I do not want to get into. I want to take a step back. Though. So uh, you know, all of this, you know, why do we want to do some of these proof of guarantees? This is the end of the last technical lecture. So you guys are free. Uh, congratulations. Uh, but you know, one of the things I want to ask is uh, I ask you to think about this question about how brittle is this analysis for the assumptions of the model. So let me create a hypothetical model, and you guys should answer me this question. Let's say I create a semi-random model. That's something we talked about in Feigen and Killian, where we allowed an adversary to make the answer stick out even more, and yet it had the downside that it destroyed many of the algorithms that are out there. So the same way I can actually think about a semi-random model here is you know, the way that I can define my semi-random model we're going to first choose omega uniformly at random and then an adversary chooses any omega prime that contains omega, and what you actually observe is you observe a i j for all i j in omega prime. So in this way, the adversary is only making your life easier. What he does is he takes the uniformly random entries. You remember, you know, people the way they use Netflix is they choose movies randomly. So everyone does that for a little bit, but then they get tired of watching really bad movies. So after that, they start watching you know, other movies, not for the social good, but because they want to watch them. So an adversary comes along and reveals even more entries in the matrix. 
And the question is, in this model, do which of these algorithms continue to work when you're given an omega prime and not an omega? So does nuclear norm minimization work? Uh, you get uh, entries for all omega prime. You observe AIJ. So all that's going to happen is in your, you know, you're going to create that uh, SDP. Look for the minimum uh, nuclear norm solution that agrees with your observations so far. Does nuclear norm continue to work? Raise of hands for yes. No? Undecided? Undecided, all right. Can someone convince me one way or another? Someone pick a side other than the undecided people. Please don't convince other people to be undecided. Uh, someone try to convince me? Convince your classmates? Should be a one sentence answer, yep. Yeah? Well, I mean, when we analyzed the uh, nuclear normalization off, it came down to sort of the norm of some operator minus the version where it was restricted to omega. And presumably that norm can only go down and omega increase. Yeah, there's actually a simpler way to say it, too. Let me say it another way. Let me rephrase that. When I give you omega prime, and instead of omega, I'm just adding more constraints to your SDP. Right? So if I had that the original matrix was optimal, among had the smallest nuclear norm among all things that agree with you know the observations so far when i add more observations all i do is i rule out more solutions but m was already optimal doesn't change anything what about uh, alternating minimization yes continues the work I see a lot of looks on your faces that you know the answer should be no, but you don't know why, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, but that's the hard part, right? I'll give you a hint. The answer is somewhere here. I claim it's completely destroyed. Yeah, exactly, right? So if an adversary reveals more entries to you, how do you know that your expectation is the true matrix? Those weren't random. Another way to put it is when I take a random observation set of an incoherent matrix and rescale it, that's a good spectral approximation via the matrix Bernstein bound. What an adversary would do is they would take some part of the matrix and overrepresent that and distort your representation, your approximation of the matrix. And then this all goes to hell, right? Then you don't have that matrix Bernstein works here. You don't have the error, that the error is necessarily small. So this is one of the important things I think about, you know, actually trying to prove that um, things work and examining different models is that you know there's worst case analysis all the way at the end of the spectrum when you have things that work there. Very difficult to find fault in them. They just work. Now, in most of the learning applications that we've seen time and time again is that these problems are hard in the worst case. So you don't want to just sit on the sidelines and be a pessimist. You want to think about what are models where you can give interesting algorithmic statements. <coughs> and oftentimes, you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, and you look at stochastic random models. But there's a big issue even in between here is understanding to what extent you're over-exploiting spectral prop you know, stochastic properties of your model. So here, the property that I'm really exploiting is the fact that you know, the observations I have, I can rescale them, and they should be a good spectral approximation. That's not actually something that goes wrong in nuclear norm minimization. So until you have the semi-random model, you would actually think that all thing minimization is just better, because it's faster, and it uses fewer, you know, less space, and all these sorts of nice things. 
and it gets similar technical guarantees, a bit weaker in what its dependence is. But you know, there's an even more qualitative gap in a lot of these algorithms that here we have one model which nuclear norm minimization works, and yet the other thing doesn't work. Yep. What about the OED and Yeah, so I mean, so for all of these things, okay, so that's even another model where you'll see a gap between what's known for SDPs and for this. So for SDPs, it turns out there are bounds that in the not quite low rank case, they have some guarantees on what their noise tolerance is, that when you take that bound and you plug in zero noise, you degenerate to exact completion. So those bounds strictly contain the types of bounds we already talked about. Whereas there are guarantees here that work in the noisy case, but they're much weaker in terms of what their dependence on the noise is, because that noise is a part of G sub i that you can never drive down. So it's just a distortion, and you actually do get quite far off from the matrix. So all of these sort of nuances change the way you understand the strengths and weaknesses of these. One is the robustness of the noise you were talking about. Another is just the robustness of the modeling assumptions, which they behave very differently. As a structure of the model, how uh, low rank is like the uh, severe variance for low rank, because the structure seems that we have some low rank mm -hmm. stuff at the end, like the low rank. So is there something that uh, uh, can be generalized to this or uh, underlying structure in practice? Or? Well, we'll get into that next time. Let's do that. So let me return your piece out. So, and, yep. so I don't know if you mentioned this, but how is this algorithm exploiting the batching that compared to like a stochastic gradient descent type of thing? Uh -huh. Like what, what is, what's intuition on why the other analysis is much harder? Oh, um, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's because look at omega 1 and look at omega 2. So if omega 2 is independent of omega 1, then you know I can just condition on where I reached after the first step and say that omega 2 is a random set of observations, and then I can matrix currents. Mm. But the issue is that when I use the same omega throughout the algorithm, yeah. it's not random. Yeah. So I don't know which matrices what, uh, I need to prove the matrix currents uh, and apply the matrix currents uh, bound to oh. until yeah, I get I to them. And at that point, I've already cool. figured out my randomness. Mm. How is that fixed? <laughs> I have too much to do. Um, I have to go to How is that fixed? Like, so. I, like high level. It's because here I, it's a principle of deferred decisions, right? So I only choose the randomness in omega 2 after I've passed phase 1 and I know what the random, uh, matrix is that I want to be well approximated by a random subset. Mm -hmm. So it's just the fact that omega 2 comes after phase 1. Okay. And that's why it's you know statistically independent of it, and I can apply lots of bounds. Whereas I have to be very careful about what you know I say about the randomness when I have one of them. Okay.